Good morning, everyone. This is new for me. My name is Kate Emerson, and I was asked by the Fort Niagara Association to come and tell you about probably their most famous heroine, a woman by the name of Betsy Doyle. Uh, there's been a lot of speculation about her through the years. They, people didn't even really know what her name was. Now, if you go to the uh, third floor of the castle, in the back there, you will see a marker to Betsy, to Fanny Doyle, no less. And the question was, who is Fanny Doyle? Well, if you read it, you can go, uh, it takes you back to 1934 when the marker was dedicated. And this is a picture of it. And there's a woman whose head is circled. Her name is Sarah Sabina Swain. And she wrote the story of Fanny Doyle. And it was probably the only story that we knew about this woman. And here it is. And it's called The Story of Laura Secord and Fanny Doyle. Um, and she talks about the two women. Well, where did she get her information? She got it from a book that was published about 90 years before this one. Next slide called Tales of the Niagara Frontier in two parts, although there's only one part to the book. And it was uh, written by a man by the name of Jesse Walker, who was a Buffalo lawyer. And in the book, he tells about Fanny Doyle. You can go to the next slide. The problem was nobody read the introductory note to this book. And part of it says, accurate dates and descriptions of places will be given though not with very much minute detail, and the names of the officers who took part in the scenes described and the events with which they were connected will be stated as far as the writer may be able to do so with historical accuracy. In other respects, the stories may be regarded as fictitious. In other words, what Jesse Walker is saying is that the big issues, the big names are correct, but Everything else is made up. Next slide. But before we get into that, we're going to do a little geography, because I know not everybody listening today is from the Fort Niagara area. We are, this is a uh, map that was made of upper, what they called Upper Canada, and you can see Lake Erie there at the bottom and Lake Ontario to the uh, right. And we're concerned with the land in between those two lakes. Next slide. And here's a close up of it. If you go on the left side, you'll see Fort Mississauga and Fort George with Newark or what we now call Niagara on the lake in between. And as you go further south, you'll, you'll hit Queenston and eventually Lake Erie. And then moving up on the left, you'll see there's Buffalo and Black Rock. Uh, then you'll come to Lewiston, Youngstown and Port Niagara. And of course, Niagara Falls is in the middle. It's the big impediment. Whoever controls Niagara Falls, whoever controls this bit of land, controls the rest of the Great Lakes. Next slide. And here's Niagara Falls. You can only sail a boat down at once and never up it. Next. Now, Fort Niagara has guarded the mouth of uh, the Niagara Strait or the Niagara River since the French in 1726. But after the American Revolution, the British, who had Fort Niagara, had to turn it back over to the Americans. Next slide. And they built Fort George right across the river in 1796. Next slide. And in this period illustration, you can see how close these forts were because you could see them across the river. They're only about a thousand yards apart. Next slide. Well, that gets us back to Betsy or Fanny, if you will. And for a long time, people said, well, it's a nice story, but it's really a myth. It's made up. She was certainly not a matross. A matross is someone who helps uh, with the guns. And quite frankly, I thought, no, I don't think so. And the reason was, if you go to the next slide, on the marker, there is a quote by Lieutenant Colonel George McFeely. And it's in his official report. And not only is it in his official report, but it was also published. Next slide. And here is a picture of that uh, report that was published in the Miles Register. And it says, an instance of extraordinary bravery in a female, 
the wife of one Doyle, a private in the U.S. artillery, made a prisoner at Queenston, I cannot pass over. During the most tremendous cannonading I have ever seen, she attended the six-pounder on the old mess house with red-hot shot and showed fortitude equaling the Maid of Orleans. Next. So how do we prove that she's not a myth? What, we just, what I decided to do was to dissect, to take apart that quote. And the first is, she was a wife of one Doyle, a private in the United States artillery. Well, that's fine. The first U.S. artillery was stationed at Fort Niagara. Next slide. That made her a woman of the army. And what this means was she was basically a laundress, or a nurse. She had to be married to one of the soldiers. There was only so many that could be assigned to a, a, a regiment. Uh, she had to be of good character. Uh, and she got half rations and her children got quarter rations. Next slide. Now, women of the army are often confused with camp followers. Camp followers were of either sex. They could be male or female. Most of them were men. They were wagoners and sutlers, you know, people who sold stuff to the army. They might be blacksmiths. Um, but there were some women who came along with them. Also, longtime visitors were considered to be camp followers. So Martha Washington and the Baroness uh, von Riedesel would be considered a camp follower. So the next part of that quote was made a prisoner at Queenston. We're talking about the Battle of Queenston in October of 1813. And if you look at things, you'll find that only an Andrew Doyle is listed as being a prisoner. Next slide. And he is captured with Winfield Scott, Next slide. who was the highest ranking of the POWs, and they were taken to Quebec. And at Quebec, Andrew, along with 23 other men, or 24, depending on how you look at it, uh, were selected by the British to be sent to England uh, for treason. And the reason they were considered treasonous was they had been uh, British subjects, but had been naturalized and had become American citizens. And Britain did not recognize American naturalization. Next slide. And a man by the name of Henry Kelly, who was one of that group, wrote a letter about how he was taken prisoner um, at Quebec, and he was taken on board a man of war and taken to England uh, and was going to be tried for treason. Next slide. And you can see here's original letter of Henry Ke Kelly, and at the bottom where that blue ring is, is the name Andrew Doyle. Next slide. And um, they were not treated very well, uh, they had neither shoes nor stockings in winter, and they were obliged to sleep outside on the deck of these old prison hulks uh, at, at Chatham uh, for a long time, but the English were afraid that these prisoners would escape. So, next slide. They built a prison, and I'll get to that in a moment. In the meantime, the Americans found out about these 23 prisoners, and they told the British, well, you took 23 of our prisoners, and you're going to try them for treason. You really shouldn't have, so we're going to take 23 of yours. Well, the British replied and said, well, if you're taking 23 of our guys, we're going to take 46 of yours. And the Americans said, well, if you're going to take 46 of ours, we're going to take 96 of yours. And it, it sounds like a playground brawl when you were in third grade. And so with the escalation of all these men being taken prisoners, it made sure that our original 23 were not tried for treason. Next slide. As I said, they were sent to Dartmoor Prison. It was a very nasty, it's a very cold place. Uh, it was, uh, yeah, okay, go ahead. And here's where it was located in uh, Devon, England. Go ahead. And uh, one American sailor says, this is the first time I was ever deprived of my liberty. And when I sit and think about it, it almost depresses my senses, for we have nothing else to do but sit and reflect on our present situation, which is bad enough, God knows, for we have. But, um, and then he goes on and says how they don't have very, they only have enough food for uh, one meal a day. Go ahead. Well, the war end of 1812, uh, you, you have a treaty of Ghent, it's signed in December. The next month, you have the Battle of New Orleans. And finally, in February, the treaty is ratified by both Britain and the United States. Next slide. 
And part of the treaty says that all prisoners will be returned. Go ahead. Well, that's not what happened to Dartmoor. These uh, POWs, of which was Andrew, were uh, kept. Uh, their rations were not improved. Their, their situation was bad. The guards of the prison got very antsy and actually shot into them. And so you had uh, 60 Americans killed or wounded. Uh, this was bad business because they really weren't prisoners anymore. So England immediately sent them home. Go ahead. And so what happens to Andrew? Here is a record uh, of him arriving at Castle Island, which is in Boston Haba, in August of 1815, and that he states that he had been a private of the artillery. Go ahead. His military pension, which he filed 60 years later in 1871, says that he enlisted at Fort Niagara, and he would get $8 a month. But it says that his wife was Nancy Sherman. Well, now where did she come from? I thought his wife's name was Betsy. But he goes on to say that they were married in 1819. So clearly something's going on here. Go ahead. He dies in 1875, and it's his death record that really shows us why he was taken prisoner in the first place, because his father had been in Butler's Rangers, and his mother's father had been in the King's Royal Regiment of New York. Both were loyalist groups that fought in the American um, revolution. But I'm here to talk about Betsy. Next. Well, she remains at Fort Niagara while her husband is a POW, and she'd have known that he was a POW. Go ahead. Um, and after the Battle of Queenston, it was decided that there would be about 30 days where there would be a truce because General Brock had been killed and everybody's kind of licking their wounds. And that being the gentlemen that they were, they would give 30 hours notice before they started to fight again. Go ahead. During this time, a fellow by the name of George McFeely uh, from Carlisle, Pennsylvania, takes over command of the fort. And um, one of the jobs he does is to remove the roofs from the two readouts and what we call the French castle today. And the reason he does this is to make them into a gun deck. You see, Fort George is about nine feet higher than Fort Niagara. So if there's artillery duel, they have the height advantage. But by making the um, castle and the, the um, readouts into a gun deck, it gives Fort Niagara the height advantage when it comes to shooting at Fort George. Next slide. And here's an artist's a depiction of what the castle would have looked like without its roof and a gun deck on top. And sure enough, According to McFeely's journal, which was nice it, it, because it gives extra information that his official reports uh, do not, he writes that at 12 o'clock at night, their cannon are loaded and everyone's all ready to, to go. And sure enough, at 6 a.m., Fort George opens fire on Fort Niagara. Go ahead. And that the battle goes until dark. Uh, he says it's the most tremendous cannonading he had ever seen, and it would have been because it was 12 hours long. You know, in one building, he has 52 shots going through it. Go ahead. Now, he did state that in his journal, her name was Betsy Doyle. So no more Fanny Doyle, people. Her name is Betsy Doyle, and she attended and served one of the cannons with hot shot during the day of the cannonading. She would take the ball tongs from any of the men, run to the fire, take up the hot shot, put it in the cannon, and run for another. This she continued for the whole day. I mentioned this circumstance in my official letter to General Smith. So red hot shot is a, in her case, a six pound cannon ball that would have been put in the fire until it was a burgundy red. It's very dangerous, and she is running this to the cannon all day. Go ahead. Now, if you come to Fort Niagara today, you will see a hot shot furnace, but it was built in 1843. So this is not the hot shot uh, furnace that she would have used. It was probably heated in one of the uh, second floor fireplaces. Go ahead. And she would have had to have run up and down these stairs without railings, in skirts, carrying a six pound, very hot cannonball. Go ahead. Now, McFeely then goes on and he said, what she did was equal to the maid of Orleans, who was Joan of Arc. Next one. 
Well, about this time, the story starts to change as people start making note of it. And a fellow by the, who we think was William Worth uh, wrote that uh, when he came to Fort Niagara in May of 1813, he goes on top of the, the uh, castle and he wants to see her and he calls her up and they look at her and they say, she's, she's no saint, she's, she's no gorgeous chick here. She's Meg Morales, go ahead. Now, Meg Morales was a fictional character uh, in the 19th century, and she was well known to everybody. If I said Princess Leia today, everybody sees a woman wearing uh, cinnamon buns on their ears. So it was with Meg Morales. Go ahead. Uh, what she probably looked like was one of these women who uh, were doing washing in these period illustrations. And she's probably looking at this young lieutenant going, yeah, right. Well. The next thing we know that happens is that on December 19th, 1813, the fort was taken by the British. So what happens to Betsy? And for a long time, we didn't know until we ran across a letter, go ahead, um, with a return of women from in the cantonment of Greenbush by uh, Colonel Simon Larned. And if you read that part, if you can, in the red, it says that there's a Mary Doyle whose husband, Andrew, was a prisoner and sent to England. They're from Niagara, and she has three children. Well, why would she be called Mary? I think it was because her name was Mary Elizabeth, but that's another story. Along with this return, uh, Colonel Lerner wrote a letter. Go ahead. And in the letter, he said, Mrs. Doyle, who lived near Niagara Fork, so we know we're talking about our Betsy, had her husband, Andrew Doyle, taken prisoner and sent to England, being born in Canada. And then he goes on to say she served the cannon in the fort one day and at various other times. Go ahead. The day before the enemy took the fort, she encouraged the militia, who was rather timid, by putting on the dress and arms of a soldier and went on guard and stood her turn through a very dark and rainy night. Go ahead. She the next day continued at her house until the enemy British and Indians had almost surrounded her when she fortunately escaped with four children, the eldest about 14. She lost all she had and by great hardship and fatigue arrived at this place. Yep. Next slide. <laughs> now, where is this place? Well, you can see Fort Niagara there. And we figured that just to get to Batavia, she had to go somewhere between 53 and 65 miles, depending on which Google map you look at. Next slide. And from Batavia, she went clear over, if you look on the right, just south and east of Albany, you will see where the Greenbush Cantonment took place. Go ahead. And this was a big uh, military base. It's where British POWs were kept. There were 4,000 men. There was a parade ground, hospital, whatever. So she felt she was safe there, I'm sure. Go ahead. Uh, this is a picture of the only building left of that cantonment. It's an apartment building. Anyway, back to the letter. Larned writes, in this instance, I have given her children rations. She has requested me to inquire whether it would be possible for her to receive her husband's pay or part of it, as it would be very timely for her. She is now in my kitchen and convalescing from a fever. She appears to be an industrious and worthy woman. So we have found Betsy and what happened to her after Fort Niagara was taken. Go ahead. But this letter tells us about Betsy's fate. It was written five years later uh, in April of 1819. So this is written two months actually after Andrew says he married Nancy Sherman. Go ahead. And it says, you'll perceive that Mrs. Doyle, the nurse, has not been paid in a year. During the whole of that time, she has been in the faithful discharge of her duty at this post. About a month since, Mrs. Doyle was confined by illness to her bed, and the day before yesterday, she died. And I am sorry to say her death was accelerated by the want of those necessities which her pay would have procured. Next she has left a daughter whose father, a soldier, is also dead and who is now left friendless on the world without any possible means of support. And it's for her account I have to request your interference to procure for her the pay so hardly earned and so justly owed her mother. Independent of the calls of humanity, duty compels me to make the above statement. So they obviously believe that Andrew is dead. 
but there is a note that says that the money was given to the daughter. So Betsy is not a myth, but she is a matross. Next slide. Today, um, she's probably one of the best documented women who manned a gun in what's called the long century. And she was named to the New York Senate's list of historic women of distinction. Next slide. Uh, we put up additional signage uh, telling more about Betsy Doyle. Go ahead. And thanks to the Pomeroy Foundation, there is even a historic marker in uh, Faulkner Park in Youngstown. Next slide. And um, Walker uh, wrote, scarcely can, can there be found in history a more striking example of the heroism of a woman. And so that's the story of Betsy Doyle. Thank you. Questions? Ah, about the children, yes. Why are there so many different numbers of children? Well, to start out with, it's that she left the fort with four. And at that time, you're running. You're, you're trying to escape the, the, the British and their native allies. So you are just grabbing anybody you can. And I suspect that at least one of those children were not her own and that eventually um, they were reunited with their own families. Now, when you get to Greenbush, there are three children. What happens to two of them? I do not know. They could have died, married, what have you. And of course, then there's the daughter that uh, the last letter talked about. Um, I have not been able to view poor house records from that area at that time. Uh, maybe we can find out what happened to her. We do know that Andrew had a daughter, um, Susan Lawton, and had a number of grandchildren and there are uh, descendants of his still running around. Any other questions? Raise my hand. No, no. Raise, no. <laughs> if you have a question, raise your hand and unmute yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's one of the biggest uh, questions I get about Betsy. And the other thing was, how was it that she and Andrew didn't realize what happened to each other? Well, these are the days before the internet. These are the days when it, it's hard to uh, write and find out what happens to people. So Andrew comes back to Boston, and we don't know what condition he was in. He's been a POW for three or four years, and so he's probably in fairly sad shape. All he knows is that the prisoners from Fort Niagara uh, that the British took when they took the fort were sent to Canada. A number of them died she just kind of disappears off the face of the earth. He, he did not know where to look. And she also didn't know um, what happened to him either as well. Do you know actually when Betsy left the fort and, and what condition she was in at that point? Well, she was in fairly good condition in December of 1813 and she is running for her life and those of the children that she has and uh, probably got to Batavia on foot. Now, whether she walked the whole way to East Greenbush, I don't know. We figure it was about 310 miles from Niagara to Greenbush. So that was, that was quite a trek. And she's doing this in winter across Northern New York with children. I don't even like doing it in summer on the turnpike in a car. And so that's the, uh, a quick story of Betsy. I hope you have enjoyed it and uh, come and, and see the uh, fort this summer when it opens up and be sure to visit the uh, Betsy Doyle Memorial. Where? We have a yep. question from Logan. Sure. Where is Niagara Falls? How, how many miles or kilometers does it take to get from Fort Niagara to Niagara Falls? Well, it's about 14 miles. I can't tell you in kilometers because I'm an old person who just knows inches and stuff, but yeah. So, any other questions before we quit? Well, thank you all very much, and I hope you have a good day. Goodbye. And we have another session on Thursday. Pam, Bob, do you want to speak on that?
say thank you to the musicians. Right. Um, our final uh, presentation is this Thursday, and we're going to be moving up in time into the 20th century. My goodness. Uh, we'll be talking about World War I and the officer training camps that were here in the summer of 1917. So we hope you'll all be back. I'd like to give a, another shout out to our field music who provide the fife and drum accompaniment uh, before the program. So thanks for being with us today. So long. Thank you.